Pastor John last week, he ended um, the series on Mark, and you know, obviously I was like, hey, it's time for Luke. And so started looking um, and reading the beginning part of Luke to, to continue the next um, sermon series. And obviously with today being the first week of Lent, um, I was hoping to find a text that kind of encapsulates and describes our reaction towards the resurrection. And now if you're familiar with the beginning part, parts of Luke, it's filled and filled with christmas themed stuff, birth narratives um, of, of John and Jesus, but it was a little hard to find something that was Easter-related, like resurrection-related, because it's such an early part of the book, right? And so I did what I learned to do, which is just read on through Luke. And as I was reading, I found myself being amazed and constantly reflecting on this character named Simeon. And his declaration, of course, in Luke 2. And when I heard what Simeon had said in um, this passage, my initial reaction was, yes, I was amazed, astounded by what he has said. But inside, if I would have to be honest and say I was a little bit jealous of what he had said. How in the world can he say something like this? I wish I could say something like that was the thoughts that was kind of going through my mind. So after some time of consideration and prayer, um, and I thought this passage had to, be, had to be one of the passages that I would love to look at, and I think it would be edifying to the whole congregation to look at, as we um, study his heart and, and kind of go through a, a time of Lent where we actually do reflect on God's um, salvation and resurrection. And to see... Um, also, the heart of Simeon and, and study his heart that is satisfied, purely satisfied by the resurrection itself. So, we'll pray and we'll get right into it. So, pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the passage and the word that you've given us. And most importantly, Lord, thank you for who you are in Christ. Um, and thank you for who you are in the word. Without it, we would not know who you are and that would be a tragedy. Lord, through the story of Simeon, um, through his heart, through understanding where he sits and where he stands, Lord, um, be gracious to us and draw us nearer to you. Draw us near, uh, nearer to that satisfaction and the joy and the, uh, all that, that, that Simeon felt in Luke chapter 2. So Lord, be with us, hold our hands and guide us. And be with me, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to get straight into Luke 2 with the context. And right off the bat, because it's the introduction of the book, um, we're introduced with a, a lot of birth narratives, both John, uh, of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And after, um, quickly after Jesus was born, um, the shepherds came to worship him. And eight days after, Jesus was circumcised according to the customs. And now we arrive at, uh, in the story from verse 22 to 24 where it was the 40th day after Jesus' birth, and the whole family came from Bethlehem to um, Jerusalem to be purified and to present the baby Jesus according to the laws. Right? So Mary and Joseph are following ancient Mosaic traditions, coming to Jerusalem to purify themselves, to get back into the normal social life with this baby who's supposed to be the Son of God. And a side note is, is, I mean, I wonder what it meant and what it felt to travel with the baby, right? And also, I wonder what it felt to go into the temple and, and for purification and redemption while holding the Redeemer in his or her um, arms. And as they're, as they're walking into the temple, um, all of a sudden, Luke turns its narrative into this character named Simeon. And suddenly we're introduced to this guy. And in verse 22, 25 to 35, the narrative is all about Simeon and what he does. And the thing about Simeon is the fact that he's such an interesting character because there's so little to know about him. Or not to know about him, but details written about him. And because the Gospel of Luke is based on um, witnesses and, and testimonies, it means that nobody really knew about this guy in the temple. 
But interestingly enough, Luke, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit somehow, thought it was important enough to include this guy into the narrative. So I think that calls us to study um, Simeon. And as we do so, we encounter verse 25, um, Luke describing Simeon in three different ways. Um, first, he was righteous and devout. That's two things, but we're going to lump them together. Two, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And three, he had the Holy Spirit upon him. And we're going to go through together what these descriptors mean to get a clearer picture at who Simeon is in order to better understand his reaction towards the resurrection. So that maybe, maybe, somehow, maybe we could join in at least a little bit of that satisfaction and all that Simeon um, feels looking towards the resurrection. So number one, righteousness and dev- uh, he's righteous and devout. It talks about his character. First, he's righteous. And the direct description as righteous in the Bible, like to describe somebody directly as righteous is very, very important because... Yes, people could be called righteous through the imputation of righteousness. Christ made us righteous. But to be directly introduced as a character that is righteous is quite rare. Simeon sits with the short list with um, Noah in Genesis 9, uh, 6 9. He's called righteous. And Job in Job 1 1, he's called upright and blameless, which is righteous, in other words. So if you survey through how people are described as righteous, we see, and we generally see them being described as blameless, upright, good, a person whose character is rightly related in sync with the Lord, one who follows the law, which is summarized in two different laws, loving God and loving others, and it points to their salvation. They're righteous in the eyes of God. And we have righteousness there, and then we're going to look at uh, what it means to be devout. In Greek, it's only used twice, and the first uh, first instance is this passage, and the second one is in Acts 22, uh, 12, when it's describing Ananias. And this word has a meaning of um, God-fearing, someone who's careful and cautious, mindful of the divine and God. His position, his perspective, um, was centered around God appropriately, which means he saw God as God, the one who holds our fate, our lives, and his palms, the king of the universe, creator of all. He knows that, and he sees God in that light, and his position, therefore, is appropriate in that perspective. He's a mere servant to that God. He's devout. And most of all, and interesting in in my opinion of all, we can assume that he had a bit of wisdom in him because according to Proverbs 9, the beginning of all wisdom is is to fear in the Lord, right? So Simeon, knowing that he's righteous and devout, we can say that he's saved upright, one who knows to love God and love others, one who fears God and has the key, therefore, to wisdom because of that fear. And so what? What that tells us is that Simeon is rightly related, in sync, in the same boat as God. He's a godly man. That's the, that's the best way of describing him. He's either unified with the Lord's will, God's will, or he's looking to be unified with God's will. He's trying his best to walk in sync. And we move on to the next um, essence of Simeon. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. We're going to build on top of his character that we kind of described, uh, that we saw Luke describe him as. And what is consolation? What well, consolation here it means the same, uh, same meaning as, um, as if we would use the word encouraging, comforting, or giving hope. Generally, when the Greek word consolation is used, it's followed or paired up by this word encouraging or encouragement. For instance, Philemon 7, 7, For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. 
Here the word comfort shares the same Greek word as consolation in Hebrews 6, 18, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, he, uh, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement, keyword, to hold fast to the hope set before us. And that word hope is the same word used here in consolation. So if you put all that analysis together, we see that the consolation of Israel can mean the comforting of Israel, the hope of Israel, or hope in Israel. But most importantly, I think this is what Simeon, or the passage is kind of looking towards, is the redemption and the salvation of Israel. Now, to think that it's redemption and salvation of Israel is actually quite appropriate because the historical context tells us that Israel is oppressed. The nation was basically a colony of the Roman Empire. I mean, they do have a king, King Herod, supposed king of Israel, but let's be honest, he's a puppet king. And in those days, we, we kind of know, if you're familiar with um, the narrative of Luke and, and Jesus' ministry, people assume that the Messiah was a being, a person who came here to liberate politically uh, in, a mili uh, in a militaristic um, fashion, liberate the nation of Israel. But what I think is when reading this passage, I don't think Simeon was actually thinking the nationalistic way of redeem redeeming Israel, but I think he was thinking Israel as in uh, God's people who are saved from sin and I say this because of two reasons. First, in verse 31 to 32, he expands on what salvation means. And what he will say is, um, God prepared in the presence of all people, all meaning not every single people, but describing what it was shown in verse 32, which is a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, Gentiles, and glory to people of Israel, Jews and Gentiles. And we see that pattern all along. And that pattern points to salvation from sin, not a political salvation. And his prophecy in 34 tells us that he's aware, Simeon is aware of what baby Jesus is about to do, save mankind. Or better put, bring us into salvation and back into the communion of, with God, which the whole story of the Bible kind of accumulates to. And so if you're putting everything together with his righteousness and devout character, what this is telling us is not only is he rightly related in sync, walking together with the Lord, what he's waiting for is not mere political salvation, but he's waiting for anxiously, like nobody else in the world, for a cosmic divine salvation, which is being with our Lord. It's communion that he's waiting for. And number three, he was with the Holy Spirit. He was blessed with the Holy Spirit. And according to Hendrickson, he's one of my favorite um, theologians to go to when it comes to kind of describing um, the situation. He says, Simeon had been endowed with a very rare and special blessing. In some manner, even now, before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit rested abiding upon him. He was being constantly influenced by that Spirit. This means Simeon was on fire with, for the Lord with that Spirit. And it's the same Spirit that falls down in Acts 2, where people start speaking in tongues, start prophesying. That same Spirit is with Simeon right now. So the dude is righteous, in sync with the Lord, waiting for the right type of salvation, a cosmic union with the Lord, and to put all of that on fire in the best way possible, in the most Holy Spirit-like way possible, he has the Holy Spirit. Now, putting it all together, the best way I could kind of describe it is, here's my um, take on, uh, my attempt at an uh, illusion is, it's like, him, without the Holy Spirit, is like a Ferrari already. Like a red Ferrari, I know. Fast, cool looking. But if we add Holy Spirit together, uh, into that, it's like having the world's best driver 
right now, uh, currently, world's, um, world champion of the F1 world is Max Verstappen. It's like having him drive the car. Imagine how fast and, and how efficient he will drive and the car will go. That's Simeon. And of course, the narrative continues in verse 26 to 27. The promise is given. And I think this is one of the more interesting and more important parts of this passage. He was promised by the Holy Spirit that he will not die, he will not see death until he saw Lord Christ, Jesus. And once again, we're building, right? If we take his character and what he has and put the promise together, imagine, I can only imagine what this guy would be like at a temple. I would imagine him as a guy who's like always there for some reason. Like at every single event, he's like there. And to get a better understanding and, and of his eagerness and his anticipation, um, just imagine, and, and, and let's be honest here, we all order stuff from Amazon. And for me, I, I, recently, I recently ordered um, a USB-C cable. Not, nothing, nothing big. But I kid you not. The day that it arrived, on Thursday, I checked nine times whether it has arrived or not, for no reason. I, didn't, I haven't even opened it yet. But even with a small package, such as an Amazon order, we have this sense of anxious waiting for something to come. And, that, and put that on steroids, and, and, and if, we are, if we are waiting on a USB-C cable, Simeon was waiting anxiously for a Messiah, a Savior, you remember the universe scale salvation, communion with the Lord. Just imagine how often he showed up at the temple. That's all I want you to know. And behold, at last, Simeon was driven, led, brought here by the Spirit, brought into the temple, and without hesitation, when he saw baby Jesus about to be presented, he randomly grabs him, holds him, away from the parents and praises and worships him and, and, and blesses God saying one of the most beautiful lines I think I've ever read in the Bible. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Now I can die in peace, Lord, take me because your promise is now fulfilled. For my eyes have seen your salvation and remember, he saw Messiah but he called him salvation. For him, Christ is that salvation, eternal life. And he's already known it. That you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And as we have already covered it, he looks forward to that salvation that has been promised to us from Genesis 3. The biblical promise of reunion to all Jew and Gentile. And he has finally seen him. The one the Holy Spirit would not stop bothering him about. The one who will bring the reality of being with God once more. Imagine that. The cosmic union with God was right in front of his face. In his arms. And what is his reaction? It's divine satisfaction. God likes satisfaction. And in verse 33, 35, he foresees the cross as he blesses Mary and Joseph, who, who are utterly amazed even when they know the truth about who Jesus is. Simeon blesses them while highlighting what Christ is here to do. He's appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. In other words, as Christ said, as Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 12, he's here to divide and judge. And he will be the one who will unveil those who are for him and who stand against him, which means that clash, that, that clash between those who are for him and against him will lead, uh, Mary's, uh, lead to the wounding, the piercing of Mary's soul. What does that mean? He's describing the cross. That the enmity between him and those who reject him is going to end up crucifying Mary's precious child. She would have to witness her son being murdered on the cross. 
And we have to go all the way with it. For what reason? For salvation. For that union to ever happen. And to wrap it up, we're going to summarize this. Luke 2, chapter 20, uh, 2, chapter 2, verse 22, 35, tells us about a man named Simeon encountering the promised salvation himself. Much like what we are here to do today, especially in the time of Lent. We're here to encounter, relate, commune with the Lord, right? And we are, as Simeon did, we are here to encounter salvation himself here as well. But after Simeon's highly anticipated encounter with Christ, he sounds off the most beautiful declaration and praise of satisfaction. Lord, take me. I can go in peace now. I can die today for I saw your salvation. And the question that runs through my mind in, in, in seeing the whole scope of this passage is how could he be so satisfied with looking at, a face, at the face of a baby who's named Jesus and nothing more? I've seen cute babies and they're cute, but it's not to the degree where it will make you say, I'm ready to die, right? And yet his satisfaction is only the thing that we can kind of dream of. It's, it's a Christian's dream to be utterly satisfied by the Lord's resurrection. And in reading, and in reading and studying this passage, the question that constantly comes back is, could we ever say anything like that as we reflect on the resurrection? And in order for us to really dig into that question and answer it, we have to dig a little deeper into Simeon's um, satisfaction. And now, before we go any further about his satisfaction, we're not, he's not saying that he wishes to die at that moment. right? But he's saying that he's so satisfied that he could go in peace now. It's an, extension, uh, it's an extent of his salvation or satisfaction. And it's not to say that we should all, like after um, gazing up at, at, at the Lord's resurrection, we should all run to our demise. That's not what he's saying. He's describing the extent of its satisfaction. So then what is that satisfaction and where does it come from? Now I'm going to use um, a handy uh, quote from John Calvin. And he really does help us see, and he puts it into words eloquently that, that we, can, we can really see where the satisfaction comes from. He says... For the outward beholding of Christ could have produced no feeling but contempt, or at least would never have imparted such satisfaction to the mind of the holy man as to make him joyful and desirous to die that extent. From having reached the summit of his wishes, the Spirit of God enlightened his eyes by faith to perceive under a mean and poor dress the glory of the Son of God. He says that he would be sent away in peace, which means that he would die with composure of mind, having obtained all that he desired. According to John Calvin, Simeon's satisfaction comes from having reached the summit of all his wishes and having obtained all that he desired. So then his satisfaction, and, and say even biblical satisfaction, is having all that we desired fulfilled. And we all know, we all kind of know the, the, the extent of satisfaction. We have satisfying moments. I'm going to kind of escalate as we go, but first we start off with an itch in the back. When you scratch that itch, it's satisfying, right? It has satisfied our want to itch the back. Second one is we, um, our, our internet world has built a culture around satisfying videos, right? Popping up pimples. Um, like slime videos, when things like kind of fit like right into that crevice. Anywho, we have satisfying videos and we feel satisfaction watching them. Or to, to kind of go up a notch, is when we finish working on something that like has been bothering us forever, right? If we put a lot of effort into it and we finish that task, right? It's satisfying and I felt it firsthand last week after turning in a, a, a two weeks long endeavor. <laughs> 
a paper about four words in Romans that took me basically two and a half weeks to finish. Man, the satisfaction um, of just like scrolling through, wow, I really wrote all this kind of thing. It's great. And let's be honest, the longer the paper, the better it gets, right? That satisfaction. And lastly, we feel satisfaction when we, um, when we arrive on Friday after a long week of work. You get home, take your shoes off, chill out a little bit. That's satisfying. Oh, and then there's one more. Um, food. Food satisfies us, right? Uh, this week I went to Pete's house, and he, he smoked a whole, rib, whole thing of ribs. Uh, uh, he fried chicken. And after that meal, I, I promise you, I was satisfied. <laughs> I don't think I ate dinner that day and lunch the following day. On top of that, that's satisfaction, not wanting any more, right? I was fulfilled. My stomach was fulfilled. But Simeon's satisfaction was something that was way beyond our comprehension, anything that we've experienced. It was one where he could want nothing more in life. It's beyond just finishing a paper. It's, it's life fulfillment. Isn't that what we want? Because his satisfaction is from finally, it's from finally seeing and being with God himself. As he holds baby Jesus in his arms, finally, salvation, he's finally with God himself. So then if you put those things together, in other words, Simeon's satisfaction is the biblical fulfillment from God himself. His satisfaction is God himself fulfilling whatever he needs inside. And we all know this passage very well, Psalm 23. It's a psalm by David that describes the fulfilling and, and the peaceful life, shalom-filled life with God as our shepherd. And it starts with what? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want This psalm screams, it screams and shouts of being satisfied and being in peace. For what reason? Because David was with God, nothing else. David was simply with God and he, God, satisfied David. Not the green pastures, not the waters. And over and over again, God calls throughout the biblical narrative... He calls us and tells us that he is the only one who could ever give us this fulfillment. For example, John 4, Jesus at the well with the Samaritan woman. When you drink of this living water, boy, you won't thirst again. This is a call to himself. He's the living water, right? And this is what Simeon got. When we read those passages, we always think, what would it be like to get that? What would it be like? That's an ideal, but guess what? Simeon actually got that. The satisfaction from the living water where his life's hunger, thirst for anything else is quenched. And it's from being with God. And from that... It's from seeing salvation that ultimately points to being with God, right? He saw baby Jesus. And just imagine with me once more to never have to chase for anything. Never wanting anything. Never feeling like our lives aren't where it's supposed to be. We gotta be over there. Why aren't we moving? Never feeling that at all and not only comfortable but much beyond comfortability but fulfilled satisfied where our lives have infinite meaning because God has ascribed those meanings to us and I dare say if we are Christians that's our heart's dream and it sounds like a dream doesn't it but then if we think about all these things, one thing we have to think about, and the question comes to our mind is, how do we get that? How do we get at least a little bit 
a little taste of that excitement and satisfaction, that anticipation and fulfillment that Simeon felt when he saw baby Jesus. What does that feel like and how do we get it? Because we too, once again, setting the parallels, are seeing the realities and reflecting on the realities of salvation like Simeon, but we, but we have so much more things to reflect on. Simeon felt that satisfaction simply by looking at a baby's face while we have the book. We know how things end. We know that Christ will, get, uh, will have to get on the cross, has to be pierced to the cross, resurrect, and we even know what happens beyond that. And yet, we can only dream of his satisfaction. To want nothing more than to see the face of Son of God Himself. That satisfaction we can only dream of, imagine of. And right now, at this moment, if, if Simeon has nothing else in the world to want, we still have things in our lives that we want and desire and has not been quenched. Desires that is other than of Christ and union with Him. And for me, I, was, I had to make a list myself, and right off the bat, I, the, the list was filled. I have so much to put on this. A good life. We all want a good life. And then to push it a little further, we might want a good marriage, marital life, good relationships. We still want a comfortable job, and if we have children, for our children, we want the best. Best education, best careers. And some of us, it's for our careers, right? Good health, all those things. And for me, if I'm being specific about myself, it's having a good pastoral career. It's having, that, having education, finishing out my degree strong so that I may be able to pursue other degrees or, or, or more studies. And even, in, 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 I mean, call it iron, ironic, but me being wanting to preach better is one of those desires that is not quenched yet by the resurrection of Christ. And please hear me out. Having these desires is not a bad thing. But I use these desires and I use the list to show the distance the distance, it indicates our distance away from that satisfaction Simeon has felt. So then seeing this distance, the burning question of how in the world do we get this burns even harder. Then, then we got to get some satisfaction, right? So then how? How do we get the satisfaction when we look upon the, uh, upon the resurrection, when we ponder about the resurrection, what Christ has done, when so many of, of our things, our desires, are of other than Christ? If satisfaction is finding fulfillment of everything that we ever wanted in our lives, that means... That means to get that satisfaction, we ha our desires have to be in sync with what God has done and what He wants. For example, okay, I'm going to try another one. We recently watched the Super Bowl, right? Um, public service announcement, I was going for the Chiefs because they have the better uniform. But let's just, instead of using, instead of using the Chiefs, let's use um, Patrick Mahomes, right? Just, just single them out. Me, rooting for the Chiefs, if I want some sort of satisfaction from watching um, the game as an individual rooting for the Chiefs, therefore Patrick Mahomes, then this has to happen. Then he has to perform and win, which is what he wants and what he wants to do. And I, rooting for his team, what needs to want him to perform and to win the game for my satisfaction. You see that sync? You see that parallel? And if I'm going for the Eagles, and Patrick Mahomes performs well and wins the game, and I didn't want any of that, and my desires were not in sync with him, then I don't get any satisfaction, right? That's how it works. And when we saw that uh, Simeon, he wanted salvation, 
right? The consolation of Israel. And he was waiting on that promise to see and be with Christ. Then we see that it's in sync with, um, with the promise and the desires of God from the begin beginning of time. As he wanted to be with us, that salvation, God wanted that salvation. That's why he created the Garden of Eden, to be with us. And moreover, he sent Jesus Christ, his purpose. So there's in line. And you see, in order to find satisfaction, this has to be in sync. We have to want what God wants. But you may be thinking, cool story, Chris. But you didn't really answer the question as to how we grab onto that. Because the conundrum is this. We have our list of wants. And what do we do about those things? Are we supposed to expect ourselves to magically want something that we didn't want? Isn't that a little disingenuous? Are we supposed to want it naturally as we come by faith and as the Spirit works in us? Or shouldn't we just, or, or, or if you go to the other way, shouldn't we just understand the fact that something is good and therefore take hold of it because it's the best? What are we supposed to do with our wants? And in order to answer this question, we have to turn to Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 to 42. And, and, and if you can, turn there with me. And it's the story of Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. And this shows us how we ought to operate. Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 to 42. And I'll read. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And 40, he, comes, he came out to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And 42, again, the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. When we come across Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane, we have to understand and we have to realize Jesus did not sweat blood because he wanted to be crucified. He didn't sweat blood to, be, to, to desire to die on the cross. He didn't want to be crucified. And, and let's, let's clear things up even, even further. It wasn't the dying part. It wasn't the pain. It wasn't the piercing of his hands that he was afraid of. But it was, going, it was the fact that he was going to be removed, departed from God. That God would look at him with all the hatred in the world and throw him away. That was what he was scared of. Jesus didn't sweat blood because he wanted to die on the cross. We may say the Father willed it, but Christ did not want to be separated with him. So what did Jesus do? One word, he submitted. And it's shown, it's, it, it's, it's echoed in his words, your will be done. He casts aside his desires to be in sync with the Lord's desires and submit. But what Christ does in the light of his desire to not go through what God wills, he simply says, your will be done. This is literal dying to himself, crucifying the flesh, and literally picking up the cross. For what? For God's will. And to be in sync and in alignment. And when we see him on the cross, and when we ponder about the cross, does Jesus struggle to keep hold on to his life? No, he doesn't struggle to hang on to his dear life. 
He concedes and says, it is finished. And he gives up his spirit, much like Simeon's resignation. He dies satisfied as he satisfies the wrath of God. The point is, of Matthew 26, submission gives way to ultimate satisfaction from God himself. Submission is the connection between God's wants, God's desires, and our desires. The thing that, gaps, uh, that, that brings the gaps together is submission. But with submission, as we see in Jesus' story, the Son of God is painful for him. It's hard for him. To deny ourselves, say no to our desires, is to kill ourselves to our own desires and to live for another. But then why? Why is that pain worth it? Why was it so worth it for Christ? Why was it so worth it for Simeon to do, to deny himself and to hang on to the will of the God? Why was it worth it? Why was Christ so joyful and satisfied even when he's hanging on the cross? And also, why in the world was Simeon so joyful about it all the time? And it's because they had their eyes on the prize. You see, they both had promises that they were hanging on to. The same promise given to us, given to us here during the season of Lent. They both held on to it, waited anxiously, felt the grand cosmic magnitude of what it means for God to promise us, not to simply, not, not just a simple promise of you will see uh, baby Jesus' face. The promise was, I'm coming now. I'm coming now to take you home. That's the promise. Wait just a little longer. I will be with you. Jesus submits to the Father and hangs on that cursed tree for this to be true. For him to actually be with us. That's why he hung on the cross. And Simeon, not only his satisfaction, but his rejoicing and praise and worship was all because finally that promise came into his arms. He is with us. He came through with his promise. That's joy. And they hung on to this promise, anticipating joy. Joy of just being with him. And you may be wondering, how could we digest this? But I honestly think we've all felt it before. Or something like it. If any of you guys, I mean, a lot of you guys will have children, or have children. But we were all children once, right? And children, one thing about them is, yes, they're messy, they're loud, they're energetic. But one thing about them is that when they're young, they get really excited and they anticipate when their family, when their parents come home or come pick them up from school. They wait and wait all day long just to see their face, just to tell them about the day, the, their day. And what they're doing is they're leaning on this promise-like sense that they will, they will surely come home or they will surely pick me up. That's the promising part. And, and if you know, children, when they're at daycare centers or, or, or kindergarten, that's all they're waiting for. All they say is, I miss mommy, I miss daddy. When are they coming all they wait for is their parents, mom and dad, to pick them up. And what happens when the parents arrive home? The kids run, they tackle, to, they, they, they rush to their mom and dad. And what happens when the parents come to pick them up? From a mile away, literally, they will start screaming at me. That's my car, that's mom's car. They're excited about that waiting. 
And, I, and after all that waiting, their waiting and their anticipation, their promise is satisfied with hugs and kisses. And like so, we ought to hang on to the promise of our God that He will arrive. We have to hang on to it like a child waiting for his mommy and daddy. And for that, we submit. And as we submit, we wait longer and longer and longer to be united with Him. And, to be, and, and once we embrace, and once we ponder, and once we recognize, and once we reflect upon the resurrection during the season, we are satisfied with God's embrace and what He's done. Through showcased through Jesus' uh, Jesus's work, death, and resurrection, and church during this season of Lent. This is what I pray for, and this is what I sincerely hope for, for all of us. That you will find the satisfaction that Simeon found in seeing the face of Jesus Christ. That we would find that same satisfaction, anticipation, as we wait for God's arrival, like children waiting for his or her mommy and daddy. Why? Because Jesus came down, died and resurrected, so that that promise could be reality. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this message. We thank you for this time. Our lives.